Our next presentation is going to last from 5 o'clock through 6, and it's uh, Faster, Higher, Stronger, the Science and Elite Performance uh, with author and um, head of operations at Wired Magazine, Mark McCluskey. Um, we'll take about a 45-minute presentation, and it'll be followed by 15 minutes of Q&A that I'll help moderate with the microphone. Um, so if you're interested, hold your questions until the end, and I'll come to you with the microphone for a question then. Um, so with that, please join me in welcoming Mark. All right, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, welcome to this 5 o'clock presentation, or as it's also known, the last thing you're doing before you get a drink. So um, I appreciate you being here. As he said, my name's Mark McCluskey. I work at Wired, and I published this book uh, at the end of last year, Faster, Higher, Stronger, How Sports Science is Creating a New Generation of Super Athletes and What We Can Learn from Them. And consistently, the question people ask me is like, well, why, why does a guy at a magazine like Wired write about sports and sports science? Um, this is me, age 17. That is not the most attractive look. Uh, Shop and Save was a local grocery store chain that I talked into sponsoring a cycling team in my very, very small town, western Pennsylvania home. Um, that's my best friend Mike, who I talked into actually starting to race bikes because to have a cycling team, I needed a teammate. That seemed like it would be helpful. Here's, here's another very unfortunate hair and fashion choice around um, the cow print sunglasses, the mullet, uh, the pink handlebar tape. It was quite a look that I was cultivating. Like a lot of young athletes, I had dreams of competing at the world level. I thought I could make it to the Olympics, perhaps, and I thought that would be pretty amazing. And, and I was an OK rider, but I was not a great rider. And after a certain point, people who I used to beat and beat really badly started to destroy me at bike races. And I reacted very poorly to that emotionally, but that's a, that's a separate story. The, the, the real thing it did is raise questions to me on why some people win and some people lose. And people who I thought I was working harder than were beating me. People who I thought I was training more than were beating me. Um, I gave up my Olympic dreams. Or at least I gave them up um, as, sorry, something's wrong with the presentation here, unfortunately. We're letterboxed vertically. Um, I'm going to, should I try and unplug this and, OK, I'm going to try this one more time. There we go. OK. Um, my Olympic dreams took place a different way. I ended up being lucky enough to cover the Olympics first at Sports Illustrated and then the last couple of Olympic games at Wired. And so my, like a lot of sports journalists, I was a frustrated and perhaps you might say failed athlete. And I, I channeled my love of sports into a different way of interacting with them. There's still some questionable hair choices. That one on the left, that's my long, sensitive ponytail in 1996 with um, a, a bad goatee. So. I, somebody should have told me that I should not make hair choices and just start there. That's how I ended up in London on August 5th, 2012. I want to show you a clip of the race that took place in the Olympic Stadium that night. Everyone who watched this in the States get to enjoy one of my favorite play-by-play -play calls of all time on this race. Uh, this is the men's 100-meter final from the uh, London Olympics. Oh, they're away, and Gatlin got away brilliantly, and he's ahead of the field at the moment, and uh, Bolt going very near, here comes Usain Bolt! Usain Bolt storming through, he takes it again, Blake gets the silver, 9.64! Oh, he's retained his title in the most emphatic way! Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant! Usain Bolt of Jamaica is the fastest man on the planet! So, two things I want to call out. The most emphatic way, I just love that. You know, NBC did not call it quite the same way. And, and the statement at the end, Usain Bolt is the fastest man on the planet. And it's hard to argue with the truth of that statement. He just won the Olympic 100 meters, and he said new Olympic record of 964. This is what it looked like from my seat. Um, a little further up in the stadium, my iPhone was not up to the task of capturing these athletes as they crossed the line, and instead tried to focus on the track itself. This is the fastest race that was ever run. Seven of the eight runners in that final broke 10 seconds. 
uh, Asafa Powell, who was that blur in the back, actually pulled his hamstring and almost certainly would have broken 10 seconds. He's done it more than any man in history. This is a, a clearer look at the end of that race. This is the photo finish at the race. And when you watch the video, and even when you look at this, it's sort of easy to agree with that statement. He's won it in the most emphatic way. This looked like a blowout in the stadium. This felt like Usain Bolt destroying his competition. But the margins are so fine at the elite level. They are so small that I want to challenge it, even our notion of a blowout win when it comes to something like this. And, and, and key to that is to talk about the idea of variation in performance between elite athletes. Not just athlete to athlete, but internally within an athlete. If Usain Bolt ran this same race the next day, would he run 964? Would he run 9.55? Would he run 9.74? Would he pull a hamstring and run 11 and a half seconds like Powell did? It's a really interesting question to start to think about. Will Hopkins, who's a sports scientist in New Zealand, has done some really interesting statistical work around what, trying to find what he terms a, a coefficient of variation around the variability of an athlete's performance. And, and this is what he comes up with for uh, elite track and field athletes. So, in short events, under 3K is where he, he has us. Basically, he says, you can expect about a 1% variation in any given athlete's performance on a day-to-day -day basis. Longer events have larger variations. And when you look at things like the long jump and discus and, and sort of technical events, those variations get much, much bigger, which sort of makes intuitive sense if you think about it. You know, the, the, the timing of something like a, a pole vault is, is highly, your, your result is highly dependent on that. So let's think about this race again. Here we are. There's a curve around Usain Bolt's expected variation on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's what it looks like if he runs 9.55, which is, is 8 tenths of a percent faster, which is another number that Hopkins has used. And that, that annihilates his own world record. Or what if he runs slower? What if he runs 971? That still would have won the race. That's how fast it was. So you think, wow, that's pretty good. Like even outside of his expected variation, Bolt would have won this race. But of course, everybody else could have had those same variations. So you can start to play with this. You know, Johan Blake wins the gold, and Bolt and Gatlin are in a dead heat for silver. Or, or you can start to make really ridiculous scenarios like a three-way dead heat for gold, and Tyson Gay just out of the medals. Or, everybody's slower and you've got a four-way tie for Braun. It's, you know, it's keynote and presentation tricks. Here's the actual race again. My point being, the difference between gold and nothing, gold and fourth place, is really, really small. And that sounds trite, but, but understanding the minuscule amounts of change that lead to those margins at the elite level is a really important thing for all of us, fans, practitioners, coaches, athletes, people in, in front offices to remember. What I want to do is, with that in mind, take a look at some things that come out of the world of sports science that I think are broadly applicable, not just in the sports world, but also in the rest of our lives, in, in, in ways that we can sort of conduct other things in our lives, and, and frameworks that we can use to think about these things, some of which that come out of the work that's happened here over the past nine years, frankly, to put these ideas into the mainstream. Here's the first one. Lots of little things become big changes. Um, I already said I'm a cyclist. This is Dave Brailsford. Um, Dave took over the British cycling program about a decade ago. British cycling was terrible forever. British cycling was a laughing stock. They didn't win a gold medal between 1924 and 1988. And, and it was a program that was going nowhere. And, and what Dave Brailsford and, and the people that he brought in really articulated was a new way of looking at improving. Instead of trying to find a huge thing to change, they were trying to find lots of little things to improve. He called it performance through the aggregation of marginal gains. You know, I don't have to explain statistics to this crowd, but you know, you have a big thing or you can find lots and lots of little things. So instead of finding something that improves your performance 1%, which at the elite level is a huge margin, or 10%, which is impossible at the elite level without doing things like doping, basically, what if you find 20 things that improve at a tenth of a percent? Like a 2% change is a huge margin. 
That's how they built this program in the UK, is through that marginal gains philosophy. Here's, here's some of the things that, that that turned into. A focus on equipment. Um, these are the track frames that the uh, British cycling team rode in London, and these are the handlebars that were made for the team. Uh, Dimitris Katsnanasis was a former Greek international track cyclist who became a composites engineer, and he started working with the UK cycling team about a decade ago. One thing that's interesting is the UCI, the International Governing Body for Cycling, now m makes it mandatory that the public can buy the equipment that's used at the Olympic Games, this incredibly specialized equipment. So I figured I'd see what it would cost to, to buy this gear. It took a lot of emails. It, it turns out the British Cycling is not actually that interested in selling you their incredibly bespoke gear, but, but eventually they, they send it to me. Here are the prices for that gear. That's, that's a 25,000 pound track frame, and that's a 23,000 pound custom handlebar. So you know, roundly 48,500 pounds, or nearly $80,000 of gear. I'm guessing that's not the actual cost of the production of one frame. I'm guessing we're amortizing costs over the 10 years of development. But it, it, it shows the immense economic investment that's made in equipment that, again, that frame might be 10% fast. I mean, sorry, a tenth of a percent faster than a competitor's frame. But this level is worth it. Some other things the British cycling team does. Um, I'm, like many of you, I'm staying at a hotel this week, and I slept incredibly poorly last night and woke up with a sore neck because I had a really crappy pillow. If I were racing an Olympic final today, instead of giving this talk, that would probably be a bigger problem for me. Um, they travel with their own pillows. The other thing this does is it keeps me from getting sick from whoever might have been in the room beforehand coughing and hacking on the pillow. Uh, this is also why most professional athletes and the British cycling team being in this are, are crazy obsessive hand washers. 7% of all competitors at the London Olympics got sick. And after you've spent a lifetime trying to get to the Olympics and at least a four-year Olympic cycle getting to that competitive moment, that's a really, really bad time to catch a cold. It's a competitive advantage to make sure that you stay well. Another thing that they're very into right now is beet juice. For those of you who are into performance nutrition, this has been sort of the biggest um, trend in performance nutrition over the past couple of years. Um, quickly, how it works, beet juice has a high level of nitrate in it. Uh, your body transforms nitrates into nitrites and then into nitric oxide in the bloodstream. That does two things. Nitric oxide dilates your blood vessels so more blood flows through them. And especially for endurance athletes, that's a pretty great thing because more blood flow means I can get more oxygen to the muscle. It also seems to make the mitochondria inside the muscle more efficient. So I can generate the more energy with less oxygen. So if I have more oxygen and I get more energy out of that oxygen, that's, that's pretty awesome. This is so popular that um, Andy Jones, who's a, a UK uh, sports scientist who is so into beet juice that his, his Twitter handle is actually Andy Beetroot. Um, we were talking about London. And he said, we, we had trouble buying beet juice in London during the games because every country was trying to buy as much beet juice as they could for their athletes. There are some side effects. This is a, a tweet from Mark Cavendish, the world championship cyclist, where, um, <laughs> where he, talks, he talks about one of those side effects. Pissing rainbows did not really take off as a, uh, a Twitter hashtag as much as uh, one wishes that it might have. This focus on these small things. Uh, before each race, track cycling races are a standing start. And they wipe down the tires with rubbing alcohol trying to remove any dirt, debris, anything from the tires. Again, maybe it gets a thousandth of a second. It's slightly better traction at that start, but track races are won by a thousandth of a second. They look at things like the warm-up period. In, in, in track cycling, you have a chance to warm up, and then you go to a staging area, and you have to sit. So as you sit, your muscles cool, and the effects of the warm-up start to, start to wane. This is Rebecca, I'm sorry, Laura Trot. And she's wearing what they termed hot pants, which we used to refer to something else in the US. These were heated pants. They had a battery and a heating elements that kept the thighs at 107 degrees. 
their research that they published after the games, unsurprisingly, they found a 9% improvement in sprint performance by keeping the muscles warm through that period. Um, what's the result? This is Laura after winning her second gold medal in the games. In fact, of the 10 gold medals available in track cycling, um, UK won seven of them. And one of the ones they didn't win, they crossed the line first, but were disqualified for crossing, crossing a line on the track by about a centimeter. It's an incredibly powerful idea, and, and one that's easy to sort of, I think a thread that connects all these ideas I'm gonna talk about is, is how easy it is to not do these things that seem obvious when you talk about it, and, and those of you who work in the performance world know that one of the exhausting things about the performance world is, is a mindset like this, is constantly questioning everything you do, every decision you make, every choice you make, to try and optimize each of those things. It's tiring, it's really tiring. And, and taking that into our everyday lives, you know, I, I did a little bit of this and my wife was to the point of nearly murdering me because I, I would be like, is this the best time for us to be eating dinner? And she, just, she didn't want to really talk about that so much. The next idea I want to talk about is this. Many of you might know, this is you know, the scientific parlance for, uh, in a paper, the, the size of the population you're studying is n. We're all really individual. And, and again, that sounds super trite, but we are so much more individual than most of us assume in our day-to-day -day lives. And, and when it comes to how we think and interact with the world to things that specifically impact athletic performance from nutrition to motivation, we're incredibly different from one another. And, and let me give you an example. Wendy Fox is a designer in Melbourne. She did this amazing infographic that I love. This is every female gold medalist from the 2012 Olympic Games. And this is Helen Glover, um, who, who won one gold in the pairs race. Uh, Helen's 5'10", she weighs 154 pounds. So, a little interactive thing. What percentage of women in the United States do you think are over five feet, 10 inches tall? Anybody got a guess? Five, 10, anybody? 15, anybody wanna go higher? Somebody back there just put up two fingers. 2.4% 2 of women in the United States are 5'10 or taller. 2.4%. In the Olympic Games, 17 female rowers, one gold, one is shorter than 5'10. So this, this isn't, if you think about it, like long levers are great in rowing. The taller you are, the longer the lever you're manipulating or with, and the more power you can generate. But this is an incredibly small population. 2.4% of people in the States, it's a little less in the UK. United Kingdom ran, I love the name of this, they ran a program called Sporting Giants, where they had a nationwide talent search saying, if you are, an, if you are a competitive athlete at the county or higher level, and you're 5'10 or taller and a woman, or you're 6'2 and taller and a man, we would like to meet you. We would like to talk to you about what you're doing athletically and if there's a sport that you might be better suited to. So Helen Glover was a field hockey player. Three years before the Olympics, she had never been in a rowing shell. And she entered this program. They did physiological testing on her. She's an incredibly gifted athlete, physiologically. They put her in a boat. She almost falls out because that's what everybody does their first time in a boat. And three years later, she wins a gold in the Olympic Games. This, this is average woman USA, as Wendy um, labeled her, 5'4 uh, and 158. Keep in mind the, the diversity of the body types we see in the Olympic Games. Gabby Douglas wins a gold medal. She's five inches shorter and weighs 70 pounds less. Sylvia Foles wins a gold medal. She's 13 inches tall and weighs 43 pounds more. Athletes bodies match up to their sports in specific ways. There are some sports where it's more and less important, but these extremes are extreme for a reason. Gymnastics, being short is helpful. Again, if I'm trying to rotate a mass, if I'm trying to flip and turn, a shorter thing to turn is better. Basketball, we all know that 
why being tall is a great thing for a basketball player. It, when, when we think of sort of athletic ability as a generalized skill, I think we miss how important it can be, especially when you're looking for those small edges at the elite level to, to have this right match between athlete and sport. Incidentally, I think it's a great argument for why we should not have kids specialize as early in sports as we do in the US, because sampling, finding that match between an athlete and a sport can be a huge help in, in them not just enjoying themselves more, which frankly is more important for like 99.99% of the population, but also increasing their possibility of, of really elite performance. Let me talk about another genetic factor. Let's, let's take our average woman and let's take 100 of her. Um, this is Claude Bouchard. Claude um, is probably the foremost researcher on the genetic influences around trainability for athletes. Uh, he grew up as a hockey player in Quebec City, uh, and he was a pretty good junior hockey player, and then everybody started get big, getting bigger and taller than he was, and he quit because he was tired of getting roughed up on the rink. Um, like many people, like me, that, that led to him spending a career now trying to answer, like, why? What are those genetic influences? He's done a study called Heritage. The Heritage study took a large population of untrained people, put them on a standardized endurance training program, and then measured how they responded to that program. How, how much stronger and faster did they get? The average person in a 20-week endurance training program, their VO2 max, which is a measurement of how much oxygen you can process, increased by 15 to 25%. Which is a pretty good improvement over 20 weeks. VO2 max is actually not terribly easy to move a whole lot more than that. So we've got our 100 people. 60% of those people sit right in the middle of that bell curve. They get 15 to 25% improvement. Another 25% have higher or lower responses, but sort of in the middle of, of the curve. It's not extreme. So, so now we're down to 15% of people who have really extreme responses to endurance training. 8% of those have low responses, far less than 15%. Some of them have adverse reactions to endurance training. There are people who, if you put them on an exercise program, their blood pressure will go up. Their cholesterol will go up, which sucks. That's terrible, right? But, you know, so if, if one of our average, our average woman USA here in red has dreams of being in a, a, a distance athlete, and is an adverse responder to endurance training. It's not going to happen. 10,000 hours, 100,000 hours, a billion hours, it's not going to happen. So you're left with about 8% of the population which has a high response to aerobic endurance training. Eight out of 100, before, before we even look at anything else. And it's not just enough to have a good response at the elite level. You need to have a high baseline. So if you have two factors, you have where you start before you start training, and then how well you respond to that training. And to get to the sort of numbers that elite athletes show in the, in the Olympics, you know, women will have VO2 maxes in the, in the um, 60s and 70s, some men into the 90s. You gotta start very high and have high trainability. And when you start to put that together, you're looking at somewhere on the order of three out of 100 of a random population. There's a couple hundred people in the room, roughly. There's probably six of us, and when I say us, it's not me, who have this combination of a high baseline and high trainability. And so when we look at these populations and we think about how do we get them to the elite level, it's important to recognize we're not all starting from the same place. We don't like to talk about that. We don't like to think that in some ways because one, one, of, the thing, one of the stories we like to tell ourselves is if I work hard enough, I can do anything. I mean, I, I trained pretty hard. I was never going to ride in the Tour de France, ever. And that's a hard thing to realize sometimes, but, it, but it's true. Richard Lewinton has a, a great metaphor for this. Genes are the size of the bucket, and the environment determines how much you pour into it. So it doesn't mean it's genetically determined. If it was genetically determined, we could do a blood test or put you on a treadmill and know who's going to win or lose. It's not that easy. but. If I only have the possibility of ever getting to a 75 VO2 max and you start at 60, 
it's going to be hard for me to beat you through hard work. For this crowd, this is obviously a, um, a little self-evident. That's what this, the whole edifice here. I, I want to go way back. This, this is the Hawthorne Works in Cicero, Illinois in the, um, in the 1920s. Western Electric, which um, they built telephones for AT&T. That, that canonical telephone that you think of with the handset and the curly cord, that's the Western Electric Model 200. It's one of the best pieces of industrial design ever. There were 40,000 workers at this plant every day. And this is the sort of place that in the 20s, as the dawn of sort of scientific management came into being, researchers from Harvard came out to this plant and they started doing some research. And they did research in this room, which is where they made relay switches for telephone interchanges. Um, some of you might be familiar with this study. This is a reasonably famous social psychology study. So the researchers are like, OK, well, they make a certain number of switches now. What happens if we raise the light level so the workers can see better? Well, they make more switches, and they turned up the lights. And yeah, the workers made more switches. And the researchers, literally wearing white lab coats with clipboards, noted that and said, OK, that's cool. And they turned back down the lights, and they made more switches. They thought that was sort of weird. They're like, OK. But if we turn the lights down further from the baseline, they turned them down further and they made more switches. And they're like, that's very strange. What if it's hotter? And they made more switches. And colder, and they made more switches. Everything that they did to change the environment, the workers increased their productivity until they ended up back at the baseline and they were making significantly more switches than when they started this whole process. This leads to the idea of what's called the Hawthorne effect or the observer effect, which is the idea that the act of Knowing that you're being measured, knowing that you're being evaluated changes your performance. Before you even see the data, the fact that somebody is standing there with a clipboard changes your performance. I should note there's some controversy about this and that the data might not be as great and there might be a better explanation that nobody ever paid attention to what they were doing before and that they were getting feedback in a way that never happened before and we know feedback's an exceptionally important vector for improving performance. You know, they, we also get this idea of this sort of self-perpetuating internal competition of like, well, this guy's watching. Let me play this game and see if I can go faster. Here's how this relates back to our world. We've got this entire ecosystem of consumer-facing devices gathering data. Gathering data used to be really hard. It is not anymore. We're carrying, 90% you know, of us have in our pockets something with a gyroscope, an accelerometer, a magnetometer, GPS chip. The, the, that's a sensor array that 10 years ago would have cost you thousands of dollars and generated data that you couldn't have done anything with. When I, when I started racing bikes, this, uh, there were no cycling coaches. This Eddie Borshevsky was the Olympic team coach in 1980 and 84 for the US, and he wrote this book. Um, still have. Here's the sort of advice that's in this book. It's kind of amazing how much of it is still good, but there's also advice to put a cabbage leaf under your cycling cap to keep you cool in hot weather, uh, which these guys were doing in the 30s. You know, in 1987, Polar invents the consumer heart rate monitor. Before that, there was, there was no way to measure your heart rate while training. The idea of finding a training zone and, and matching your effort to a particular physiological outcome was impossible. Um, they developed in the 70s for cross-country skiers. This is the first one that sort of was available to the general public. And um, my first media job at that point, I was in high school. And I was working as a DJ at a small local radio station and saved all of my money. And I bought bike gear with it, in including I actually bought one of these then. And um, it really didn't didn't help that much. T today, this is a couple of months ago, this is a ride that I did on my power-enabled trainer at home. So this is, those of you who are riders, this is a very easy ride. But this measures exactly how much power I generated. I, I burned 250 kilojoules of, uh, of energy. Um, my, net, 
a net power was about 140 watts. It's a recovery ride. The, this level of granular data is, is insane compared to what happened in the past. Leading to things like this. This is Zwift, which is this, it's a virtual competitive world for cyclists that, that relies on power trainers to put me in a race against other people. What's incredible about this is if I can put out the watts in this game, there are professional cycling teams who are monitoring riders in this virtual world to see people who, have the, who might have the physiology to make it on the Pro Tour. Because watts are watts. Me at home on my trainer in Oakland, I measure watts and they're produced the same way as a guy riding in the Tour. And if I can produce 6.2 watts per kilogram of body weight, I have a chance of being on the podium in the Tour de France. And maybe I'm some kid in Omaha. Yeah, I, I, it, it boggles my mind that we absolutely will identify people who race at the professional level through a video game. You, you take it to the, the professional side, this is the Optima S5 from Catapult Sports. Um, came out of research from the Australian Institute of Sport. It's used in a lot of, um, it's used on the field and the data is used in game in a lot of Commonwealth countries. This is Brian O'Driscoll uh, playing rugby for the British and Irish Lions. Um, it's being used by a lot of pro teams in the States, but it's currently not enabled during games and the direct feedback during games isn't, um, isn't there. If you want to learn more about this, there's actually a panel tomorrow morning that I'm moderating with uh, people from Catapult and Zebra Technologies and the Warriors of Browns to talk about how this technology is coming more and more quickly into the actual competitive situation. And there are monitors like the push band, which measures the velocity of your weightlifting. It's not just, not just counting reps, but how fast am I doing the rep? What power am I generating? Sports view, sport view we've talked about forever here. Kirk is maybe somewhere in the room. I'll embarrass him by putting his picture up here on the screen and, and talk about sort of what he's done here. What's interesting about Kirk and what he's accomplished and what I think some of the other things that have come out of this conference have been is not just the gathering data of data, but the storytelling out of the data. It's something that you might have heard already today. I think it's a theme that is emergent almost every year at this conference, and that is it's not enough to have the information. Data isn't power as much as I said it was at the start. Data is a starting point. Data isn't knowledge. Data isn't information, data is data. And, and it's bridging that gap, and especially bridging that gap between the data gatherer and analyst and the decision maker at, at the team or the individual athlete that, that's really crucial for us to actually move forward on some of these th insights that, that this group has, has been generating. Atul Gawande has a wonderful book called Better where he talks about we don't even get the things right that we know work. And it, it, we're so drawn to the novelty of, of a shiny new thing that we forget to do the things that are really, really important that we already know work. What's the most popular food venue at the Olympic Village every year? McDonald's. Here's, here's athletes lined up at McDonald's in London. Um, look, I like a Big Mac every once in a while, uh, you know, but it's not just McDonald's. It, it's, it's this idea that there's low fat, high carb, you know, restricting various nutrients in different ways. Can, can you restrict your fat during a training program and then somehow become more efficient at burning fat? This is another situation where N really does equal one. I, I have colleagues who've lost 50 pounds on a low carb, high fat diet. I would wither away to nothing. I, my metabolism does not allow that to happen. I actually tried it for a few weeks and my cholesterol shot through the roof and my doctor's like, please stop. Um, you also have to try not to overcomplicate things, especially for athletes and especially in, um, team sports where you're traveling a lot. Uh, Phil Wagner is a sports scientist who I write about in the book. He, he runs a place called Sparta Performance Science in, in Menlo Park, California. He has a lot of professional clients and, and he said, look, you, you can have the greatest nutritional plan ever and if you don't execute it, 
It's meaningless. So he tells his athletes to do two things. It's all he wants out of them. He wants them to eat one gram of protein per pound of body weight per day, which is more protein than most of us eat. And he wants them to eat two fist-sized servings of vegetables a day. He said, if you do that, you've done 80% of it, and I just really, I need you to do this, if nothing else. And it's something the athletes can actually implement. It's an important lesson that, that we don't overcomplicate things. You know, the day, day seven of your East Coast road trip is a difficult time to, to remember to do all of this stuff. None of us sleep enough. I would be willing to bet nobody in this room sleeps enough. This is the 2005-2006 Stanford Cardinal basketball team. They were an okay team. They went 16 and 14 and lost in the second round of the NIT. Sherry Ma is a researcher at the Stanford Sleep Science Lab and came to the team and said, hey, I'd like to do an experiment. I'd like to see the effects of sleep extension on your performance. So they decided to do that. So they, um, they started by gathering a baseline for how much the players were sleeping. They, they all said, oh yeah, I'm sleeping, you know, seven, on, on average, 7.8 hours a night. And they put sensors on them and found they were actually sleeping about six and two thirds hours a night. They established that baseline. They did some testing on the court. They did sprint tests, they shot free throws, they shot three pointers. And then they were urged to do one thing. The prescription was sleep as long as you can. I don't care what you do, sleep as much as you possibly can. And they started to average almost eight and a half hours of actual sleep a night, which is a lot. That's more than most of us in this room certainly sleep. So after five to seven weeks of that sleep extension, here's what happened. Their, their sprint time, this is a 282 foot sprint back and forth, those of you who players. Um, they're seven-tenths of a second faster on average. Every player on the team was faster. Their free throw shooting improved by 9% on average. And their three-point shooting by a little over 9%. Remember I said earlier, like 9% improvement is what you see from doping. That's roundly what EPO gives an endurance athlete is 9% improvement. So think about sleep not as a necessary evil, which is how we often conceptualize it. We, like, we have a very interesting cultural thing about sleep in the United States where it's sort of this waste of time or there are other things I'd rather be doing. Like, if I could leave you with one prescription from today, try and sleep more um, because it, it really is a performance enhancer. One last thought I'll leave you with and then we can open it to some questions. The only sustainable advantage is to learn faster. Um, Ari de Geis was, um, he invented the idea of scenario planning working for Royal Dutch Shell. This is Ari. And, and that's something that he said. The only sustainable competitive advantage is to learn faster than your opposition. Everything in the sports world is so scrutinized. Like when, when we come up with an innovation, when you do something new and different, it's there for the world to see. And, and it's tomorrow's baseline. You know, famously, I was talking, you know, we all talk about this, and we all talk about Billy Bean. I, I mean, sorry, we all talk about Billy Bean. And I would argue that the lesson that we would draw 10 years on from Moneyball, which is kind of an amazing thing to say, is not that there were a, a raft of insights in the organization about the game itself. Many of the things that, that the A's did were ideas that had been in the sabermetric community for a while. What, what Billy was able to do was align his organization around those ideas. He was able to build an organization that acted on those thoughts and ideas. And, and they were able to try things, learn from them, reject them, and move on. If you look at what the A's do now compared to what the A's were doing 10 years ago, 10 years ago, the A's didn't, like the A's played Matt Stairs in center field 10 years ago. You know, the A, they couldn't measure defense. They decided it wasn't important. Now it turns out that they consider it very important and they've oriented a lot of their decisions around defense because now they see that as a competitive advantage. It's an organization that's able to grow and learn and change. And, and 
I, th I think to me that's the most compelling thing about the sports science world is all any of us can do is really keep our eyes and ears and our minds open to new ideas and new possibilities in a given situation and be willing to learn to try them, be willing to fail, which is hard. And you know, we, we're so stuck in our ways. We get stuck in our thinking. And, and I think we consistently fall behind competitors who are more nimble and more willing to challenge themselves. So that's, to me, the, the great joy and torment of working on the edges of science and performance. Uh, you have to keep moving forward. You have to keep pushing yourself. And in, in the time I spent reporting and writing about this world for my book, I think that that's really what, what I've tried to take away and, and fold into my own life. So I, th I thank you all for your time. Uh, this is my website, and, and we can take some questions. Come in with the mic here. Uh, in the foreseeable future, if it's not already happening, just out of public sight, uh, bioenhancement, genetic engineering, all these rapid advancements of technology, um, how do you see this affecting sports um, and also like affecting how we view performance enhancing drugs, performance enhancing procedures, sure. et cetera? So let me separate that into two questions. Um, the first being w the idea of genetic enhancement and bioengineering. There's no, you know, David Epstein in his amazing book last year, there's no sports gene. There, there's no gene for any, there's no gene for any one thing except a couple of very specific genetic diseases. Height is highly heritable. Height's about 70% heritable. When you look at the actual mutations on the cell that lead to that variation, you start to look at something on the order of 50,000 different variations that you can associate with changes in people's height. Now, height's a pretty straightforward characteristic. So if, if it is so complexly affected by our genome, it's hard for me to imagine that things like the ability to benefit from endurance training or strength training or a proclivity for wanting to be awake early in the morning to train, which has a genetic component. They're like, there's a genetic component to being an early or late riser. It's hard for me to imagine that those things are any less complicated genetically than height. And, and so the idea that I'm going to be able to go into somebody's DNA and start to really manipulate it at that final level Someday, sure, because I'm never going to say never because you're always wrong. Um, but it's hard for me to imagine that that's anytime soon. How that relates to performance enhancing drugs, I, I think. I think performance enhancing drugs are. Um, I think the general public's frustration with them is about the way that we feel that it distorts the game, the way that we feel it distorts what we're measuring. And, and some of the arguments that have happened in the past about like, oh, well, it's just leveling the playing field, right? Well, no, it's just a different uneven playing field. Again, different people respond differently to different drugs. And, and so, you know, I, I, in my younger, more impulsive days, made the argument that we should legalize drugs in sports and let people do whatever they want. Um, I had a lot of athletes, when I was talking to them for this book, tell me what a jerk I was for suggesting that. And what it really comes down to, I think, is not, it's almost more about protecting the ability for the clean athlete to be competitive than it is about catching the cheat. You know, people, people cheat and do bad things in the world. People kill other people. People get away with murder. We don't decide, and this is a super overblown analogy. We don't decide to legalize murder because some people get away with it. I, obviously, this is not on the same level. But you know, we continue to, to try and fight this because I shouldn't have to make the choice to dope, to endanger myself in some way, to be competitive. Hey, Mark. Hey, um, Brent. Last summer, the German national soccer team uh, took the extra step to create their own training complex in Brazil 
for the World Cup. So they'd have complete control over you know, everything that was going on in their training environment. It was almost like a laboratory. Uh, do you think there are sport teams that are uh, about to or looking at taking that extra step and turning their, their team into, into kind of a research lab? I think some. I, I think some teams have made that step. I, I. I think if you look at what the Sacramento Kings are doing, I. I, I think that 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 franchise is sort of imbued with this idea of we're going to blow up everything from the way they're managing their D League team with the the crazy system, which is kind of incredible to watch if you haven't watched it, to to all of the things around that franchise. You know, it, it may work, it may not work, but. But I think, I think that there is some of that Silicon Valley culture that comes in the, when you talk to Silicon Valley entrepreneurs, they say fail fast all the time. And I, I'd actually rather not fail, but it's better to fail fast if you're going to. And, and that ability to try really radical new ideas and be comfortable with that is, is a really interesting thing to see at the sort of professional franchise level. Um, early in your talk, when you're talking about the 1% variation in, in sprint times or 1.5% long distance, um, is that sort of random variation? Is that sort of a hard limit on like what will always be there? Uh, is that something like what these little aspects of sports science, these marginal steps can kind of shift people towards? In that case, is it sort of like an envelope of how good um, people can be? I'm just trying to understand what that is. Yeah, uh, so, so how Will conceptualizes that in his research is that that is just sort of the inherent variation in human performance today. I think you raise an interesting possibility in your question, which is as we learn more and more about this, can, can we sort of shrink that variation because you, you eliminate more and more factors that might change the performance? I, the, I think there's always going to be that variation. But, but yeah, I think it's a very interesting idea, actually, that you might sort of shrink that, that window. Those really aren't sort of limits on performance. That, that's just about, on a particular athlete, what would we expect their variation to be over, over different competitions? I guess this is kind of going off that. Do you see a point in the future where the human body can't go any faster or do anything like that? They can't get bigger, faster, or stronger, and all the variations based off that day or based off uh, equipment? So, so the last chapter of my book is, is that question. And there's some really fascinating research a guy named um, Mark Berry is a biologist at Stanford who, who wrote a paper looking at the progression of times in human foot races, greyhound racing, and horse racing, which is already a slightly provocative idea, right? Do, do, do we get any better, any faster than animals? Um, and horse racing has been plateaued since the 70s. Greyhound racing has been plateaued since the 60s. Um, we have not reached a performance plateau yet, but it, you know that curve's flattening out. That curve is definitely flattening out. You just plot the times, and those of us who like math look at a curve that's flattening out and think that we're reaching a limit. You know, so where is that limit? Here's the flip side. Um, Andy Walsh is the high performance director for Red Bull. One, one thing that's interesting in the US is how much of this work happens at the corporate level. There's no nationally funded infrastructure for sports science research, and a lot of that happens at companies like Red Bull. So down at Santa Monica, they have a, a pretty large sports science apparatus and a bunch of very smart people. Um, and he used to run the US ski team's high performance program. And I was down there talking to him. I said, oh, look, OK, so what's the limit? I like, obviously, nobody's going to run 100 meters in six seconds. It's like, well, sure. Yeah, it's he said, a bean will run 100 meters in six seconds. It's like, it might not look like we think human beings look like today. It's a pretty far out idea. And, and you know, you, when, you, when you start talking about the time scales that allow that thing to happen, you know, I would project that at tens of thousands of years. I, I think he is the sort of thinker and optimist who thinks that we can really accelerate that through science. Any more questions? With that, please join me in thanking Mark for his presentation. Thank you.